Good morning. Today is Tuesday, April 12th, 2022. I love Pesach and I love the Pesach Seder. But I have to confess, I can't say that I love every moment of every Pesach Seder. I will confess sometimes I get a little frustrated. Perhaps even I get a bit short-tempered. Sometimes I'm tired. If there's someone who is acting up, children who are not interested. Now, I think I would like to say about myself, I think that I've gotten better at this over the years. Perhaps others around me would disagree. But what is clear to me is that our experience at the Seder will largely depend on our attitude going into it. And by preparing our attitude in advance, we have much more control over what we will get out of the Seder. So here's one idea that we started a number of years ago. It's not original. We heard about it from someone else. It works if you are blessed to have children at the Seder of a certain age, and especially due to the fact that, especially here in Montreal, the Seder starts very late at night. So there is this competition between young children being able to stay up and participate versus starting at the correct time. And it can lead to uh, not the best uh, atmosphere at times. But the truth is, and I've said this before, the Seder should revolve around children. If there are children, if we're blessed to have children at the Seder. And that means that all adults, at least for a while, need to realize that they are observers. They are not the main character among the participants at the Seder. For a while, adults should be very happy to be the audience. So what we do in those years, and I confess we have not had one of these years in a couple of years, but we're looking forward to it this year. In those years when we do have children who are old enough to be able to participate somewhat in the Seder, but not old enough to stay up for the entire or even most of the Seder, what we do is we start our Seder at home with a mini Seder led by the children. And what they do in this mini portion is they will show us the Haggadah that they created in school, the art that they made in school, They'll have a chance to hide the Ophikomen. They will make the blessings, the brachos that they learned over the grape juice, over the matzah, over the marar. They will sing the songs that they learned in school. They will do all of the rituals that they learned about, maybe out of order. And they will ask Manishtana, the four questions. And then... For just a few minutes, I will sit with each child individually and I will try in simple language directed to that child to answer those questions directly, simply and briefly so that each child will have a simple individualized answer to what does it mean that we were slaves? What does it mean that we went free? What does it mean that God redeemed us? What does it mean that we now form a people? What does it mean that we're supposed to remember every year? Because this is the main mitzvah of Pesach. 
that children should understand on their level slavery, freedom, redemption, and all the rest of the Seder, the deep adult conversations, the discussions about Ukraine, the text, the rituals, the mitzvos, all those things that Jewish law requires, which of course are important, but they are all secondary to children appreciating, understanding, and enjoying the story and the experience. It's just a suggestion. It works well for us depending on who is there and what age, but it's a suggestion. Like any major production, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. And keeping things smoothly on track is an indispensable skill in creating a meaningful experience for everyone at the Seder. There's a great story, and I try to keep this in mind. I've spoken to you before about a great rabbi. His name was Rabbi Yitzchak Kutner, a blessed memory. A brilliant scholar. I've quoted some of his ideas. He was, to be very blunt, an intimidating person. I once had the privilege, not only, I had the privilege a number of times to hear him teach in person, which was an incredible experience. I also had the privilege once to meet with him in person to discuss an issue with him. And the phrase, his eyes pierced through my soul, those words were written for him. He was sharp and he was intimidating. One year, there was a young man who somehow got up the nerve to ask if he could join Rabbi Hutner at his Seder at his house. And he was shocked when Rabbi Hutner said yes. And this young man was hysterically frightened. What is he going to do? What is he going to say? He's going to make a mistake. This is Rav Hutner. He's going to get torn to pieces. And he was terribly frightened, terribly nervous. He came to the Seder. The Seder began. And this young man, in his nervousness, jostled the table and a full cup of wine fell all over the tablecloth. And this young man, he wished he could disappear. And with no hesitation and a smile on his face, Rabbi Hutner said to him, a Passover tablecloth without a wine stain is like a Yom Kippur machsar without tears staining its pages. How we react when something out of the ordinary happens, that's what determines the mood of the Seder. Here's a related idea that comes from Rabbi Melech Biederman. There's a very strange statement in the Talmud, also about spilling wine, but with a slightly different message. There's a statement in the Talmud which says, Kol bayis she'enu nishpach yayin kamayim, eno roa simen bracha. Any house where wine is not spilled like water, there will be no blessing in that house. Very strange. In order to have blessing in your house, you have to spill wine? What kind of sense does that make? So there are a number of commentators that make the following insight into this line. 
This line is not about how clean your house is or how white your tablecloth may or may not be. That's not the subject. The line, of course, does not say that pouring wine in your house leads to blessing. It says spilling wine that is like spilling water brings blessing. And the meaning of that is wine is more expensive than water. Spilling wine usually makes a mess. And if it's on a tablecloth, the tablecloth could be ruined. Spilling water is usually not such a big deal. You dry it up. It usually doesn't ruin anything. It costs nothing. It's not a big deal. It's likely that if a person does spill wine at the Seder, they may be embarrassed. And the person who has to clean it up or later to wash the tablecloth may be somewhat frustrated. It can interrupt the mood of a Seder. But if we follow the advice of the Talmud, where nishpach yayin kamayim, where if wine spills in our home, we consider it as if it's just water. It's not a big deal. It's not something we're going to focus on. There's no reason to be upset about it. There's no reason to be embarrassed by it. Nothing is ruined. Everything is fine. It's like a little water spilled. If that is truly our attitude, that's when there is a simon bracha, a blessing in that house, because that's a household that's concerned about what's important, concerned about the holiness of the evening, concerned about the mitzvot of the evening, not concerned about secondary collateral issues what needs to be washed later on, what stains there are, that's not important. That's not significant. If we have our priorities and our attitude focused on what is important at the Seder, and we distract from ourselves those things that could interfere but are really secondary, they really have no place. So the food was not quite hot enough, or maybe it was a little bit too hot, or it could have used a little bit more salt, or a little bit less salt. Those things are not important. That's not what the Seder is. And if we can prepare ourselves to focus on what is important and to treat all of those other things like just the spilling of a little border, which is what, in fact, those things are at the Seder, then we will have a blessing in our home. Then we will be able to appreciate what the Seder is supposed to do for us, the grandeur of the Seder. We'll be able to appreciate what we can achieve spiritually with the Seder, what we can achieve socially at the Seder, what we can achieve emotionally at the Seder without being distracted by unimportant, secondary, lower-level details. What should the priority be? What should our focus be directed towards, if not on the stained tablecloth? Let me share with you the insight of Rabbi Schneer Ashkenazi. He spoke about a subject that we have discussed before, the game children play at the Seder of the Afikomen. Of course, near the beginning of the Seder, we break a matzah in, in pieces. A larger piece we keep till later. We call it the Afikomen. It's going to be the last thing that we eat at the end of the meal. And we have this game, the children will hide the afikomen, and then there's some bartering about getting it back, and there are presents that are offered. And then finally we get the afikomen back, and we eat the last piece of matzah, and we lead towards the end of the Seder. 
On the Seder night, what we need to focus on is every single element. Remember, children are the central participants of the Seder. And that means that every single element of the Seder is pedagogical, teaching educational lessons. What's the educational lesson of the Afikoman? You know, if you hide the Afikoman and children are looking for it, they don't look on the table. They don't look on the sofa cushions. They look between the sofa cushions. They look underneath the sofa. Children don't focus on what is obvious, on what is overt, on what is visible. Children don't focus on the messages that their parents give them that are open, like what we tell our children. That's not what our children pay attention to. Children pay attention to what is really important to us that may be hidden, that may not be so visible to the rest of the world. Because children understand what is really important to us. Children understand what our priorities really are. Our children know how to read us much better than we give them credit for. And so while we may say messages to our children, our children know not to pay much attention to what we say. But they pay an incredible amount of attention to what we do, often in a non-so-visible way. If we spend time volunteering our time and effort to helping others, that's what children see as important to us. If we spend time attending a Torah class, even if we don't talk about it so much, even if we don't make such a big deal about it so much, that's what children see as important to us. When we show enthusiasm for a principle, children see that it is engraved upon our hearts. We don't need to talk about it so much. Children are not going to pay attention to what we overtly leave on the table and say openly. Our children will always understand the afikomen that is inside of us, where we have hidden it, where we have placed what is really most valuable. And here's the key. The more that we demand of ourselves, the more that we focus not on what we tell our children, but on the role models we are within our own behavior, the less we're going to try to convince our children with our words, which so often does not work. The Seder night, is an opportunity to excite children over the most exciting story in all of human history, the exodus from Egypt. That's where our focus should be. So if the wine spills, or someone falls asleep, or someone gets tired and goes to the other room, or you don't get to that deep discussion that you had prepared to ask or to answer. Don't focus on that. That's not what's important at the Seder. What's important to focus on is on what is really important. Are we conveying to our children and to each other that this is the most exciting story in all of human history, our exodus from Egypt. And if we do that, if that is our attitude, then all of the rest will not matter 
and that our experience will be transformative for everyone. My friends, I want to wish you a great day. And I wish for you a wonderful attitude and a fantastic experience at your Seder. And I look forward to seeing all of you soon in person.